anything to this fog. Maybe we missed it. Nim? 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 What's that? I've already given you your lunch, Nom. There's no need to get so irate with me. <sighs> nim. Nim. Ah! Nim, nim, ah! Nim. I think there's something nim. out in the distance. I think... Is that... That's an island? I don't... I don't think it's ours, Nom. Nim, nim, nim. Nim. Well, I think we should stop and ask for some directions. Nim. I wonder if that guy has finished the commission yet. So before we start, why don't we preface everything with a little bit of history? For knowledge is power. <clears throat> so, a quick note. Do I know exactly how many polygons were used in your old PS1 games back in the day? Uh, kind of varies. I searched around a library a bit for hours and came to the conclusion that it was low. Like, very low. Like mostly blocks low. Games like Resident Evil mostly use pre rendered backgrounds, while games like Silent Hill used mostly all 3D assets. To save on processing power, most objects in the distance were not even rendered until you came upon them, which of course was the original reason why Silent Hill used so much fog to begin with. Mmm, look at it. It's. Mmm, it's beautiful. But regardless, everything was kept low for both processing efficiency and information space on both disk and hardware. So we'll be keeping everything as low as we possibly can here today. The trick is to imply what is there and leave most up to the imagination. If you take proper advantage of your limitations, you can create some very interesting and artistically expressive pieces. And lastly, something to keep in mind is this is a rather large project, and everything will not be done in just one video alone. I'll focus mostly on the big picture here, with a few details, uh, you know, scattered about, but most of the other work will be done in later videos, so stay tuned. So for the sake of keeping track of scale, I have a virtual model of myself right here. If you have precise measurements, this will work wonderfully, but for me, this is fine. I like the human touch anyway, which makes everything look real nice. For reference, uh, here's a sketch of what I'll be making today. So I started out by hitting the 7 key to look down, then shift A, and then I selected a box to work from. From here I scaled everything up to make a set of stairs. 
I merged the end down here with Alt M and merged everything at the last option. No, last. Then I extruded the back faces out to sculpt the general shape of the hill. Collapsing faces like this, like I'm doing, is a great way to not only save on poly space, but also stylistically, it works. At some point I realized just it just wasn't quite big enough, so I just selected everything by hitting A, and then scaled it up by hitting S. After further adjustments, I added this edge loop here by hitting Control R to loop around the entire mesh. The reason it stopped is because the ramp is basically one sideways rectangle. Scale that bad boy in and we have ourselves a really nice shape here. I cut the side into three triangles and made the ramp slash stairs look even more natural. Naturally, hills have some humps and bumps in them, uh, so I move the geometry up and down to create uh, ground variations to add some character. Lastly, I gave it a name, and then it was time to move on to the ground level of this island. When making the rest of the island, it was pretty much the same. I made myself another cube and just got to work on the top half of the island. Uh, for now, I would not really worry too much about the bottom just yet, it, that, that would come later. One thing to keep in mind when using a first person's perspective is that the PS1 could not handle angles too well when it came to textures. This is why the textures warped the way they did. The same thing is true with shaders and tools that emulate PS1 graphics. The more faces you have, the less warping you will have. So for your walls and doors, perhaps it's worth your time to have slightly more faces than normal so you can control the warping just a little bit more. And make it look real nice, regardless of what angle you behold it at. Hmm, for the boathouse, I'll need a pathway to it, so I made a rock jutting out of the island, just like so. True, we could have made it its own object, but we'll manipulate the mesh in such a way that it keeps the poly count much lower than you would expect. Lastly, merge the vertices together and uh, move faces up and down a bit, and we're all set to start working on something else for a while. Uh, you know, I don't really have a precise model of the vessel that this person has, but you know what? At least I have some of the uh, general dimensions. Next, I'll work on the boathouse. It's an airship, clearly, and therefore it will need access to 
air. Go into file, then import. I brought an external model that represents the general shape of the vessel that the, com the commission client asked for. After rotating it 90 degrees, I put it roughly where it was going to where I was going to build the structure. This thing was definitely a multi-step model to create. Um, lots of layers to this one. For starters, I began construction with a cylinder with 12 vertices, like so. I rotated it, lined it up, and stretched it to create the general shape. I wanted the walls to be even, so I copied the X position of the vertices above the ones that I wanted to move, then pasted them into the X value uh, to even them out. Then I moved and scaled some of the vertices up uh, to, to kind of define the overall shape. Next was the problem of the size. After figuring out how big I wanted it to be, I then deleted the bottom faces and the giant ingons on both the front and the back. But that's not all. I'm a firm believer in the optimization process. So I centered the model by going into object mode, then selecting the boathouse, then going to the object. here at the top and set it to uh, set origin. Then finally selecting origin to geometry. This centered the entire piece. Then I added a mirror modifier, which can be found in the modifiers tab over here. And then I deleted the faces on the X axis so I could work on one side and have the other one be affected evenly. From there, I stretched and pulled lines, moved myself in to get a proper view of things. And then I cut myself a door using edge loops. And I also made myself these small stairs too. But in doing so, I decided to cut off the other side here and tick the Y button. So that way I would mirror it on the Y axis too. And this is to save even more time. I would still need to edit it anyway later, so I mean, it's no big deal. Like say, applying the mirror modifier and filling in these holes on the other side. Mmm, yes. Perfect. And, <clears throat> and that's all fine and dandy, because it's time to make some windows and apply another mirror modifier anyway. Now, the next question was depth. Blender has some pretty nifty tools to help us out with this problem. Overall, I wanted it all to remain even. So I went back to the modifier tab and selected the solidify option. This basically creates an external or internal mesh, or shell if you like. It works very well when you are working with planes, but it doesn't work so well when you have an enclosed mesh, or at least I have yet to make it work very well for me. However, that's no big deal. Just separate that portion from the rest of the mesh by hitting, well, selecting it and then hitting P, and then uh, tab it out and you're all set. Now I have the boathouse, and I have some stairs. Just take the modifier up the stairs, and we're all good. Mmm, now that's real nice. Close this bit off, and we're moving on. But wait, we're missing something. Windows, that's it. The amazing thing about this modifier is it makes crafting windows extremely easy. Just select the faces you want to put the windows, and then just simply delete them. The modifier will take care of the rest, and boom! Look at that. Look how easy that is to make. Now anytime you want to adjust the position of the windows, like scaling them, whatever, you don't have to worry about the internals. You don't have to worry about all the other vertices because, quite frankly, they don't really exist yet until you close the modifier. The inside will take care of itself. Just make sure that you handle the outside. It is fantastic. And then after that, I just decided I wanted to clean some things up a bit. This portion of the process where I was just, you know, collapsing vertices and reducing the amount of polygons. This could mean that my textures may warp a bit, but um, I'll fix that one if I need to. Skipping ahead a bit, I added some braces here and there, and added some levitation support to make it hover in the air. The squares down there are mostly to help me know where I'm going to put the particle effect or levitation magic. And overall, I think this looks pretty good. Whew, well that took some time to set up. So let's top things off with some deck work. To make this deck, I just basically extruded from the ramp over there to craft me a deck.
Then lastly, I made the rails using a simple plane and mimicking the general shape of the deck itself. Boom, it was done. You know, I don't understand why you don't just take some time off, especially after getting this new commission. You know, if you keep pushing yourself this hard, you, your wounds won't heal. Yeah, I get that, but look, you're just pushing yourself too hard. Just settle down and drink this. It'll help you heal faster. Yeah, I know it's watered down, but unfortunately that's the best I can do. I'm not exactly a herbalist or a healer or anything, it's just the best that we got. So why not use it? Ouch! Fine! Be that way! <sighs> Here's your payment. <sighs> Let's see what this thing is anyway. Huh. It's from a guy named Danny Arcadia. Interesting. Huh. Looks like he wants to do a podcast. Hi! <laughs>